In the U.S., it has been estimated that 4 to 8 percent of us have at least one food allergy, and the incidence is growing. There are so many questions to ask, like does early introduction of a food help a child avoid getting a food allergy? Welcome to Nutrition Edge on ReachMD. I'm Kathy King. Our guest today is Deborah Indorado, a nutrition advisor with kidswithfoodallergies.org, a division of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. Deborah is in private practice in Apollo Beach, Florida, where she counsels individuals on nutrition. Today we'll be exploring food allergies. Deb, welcome to the program. Hi, Kathy. Thank you for having me on the program. There's so much to share on this interesting topic. Newer research is describing early introduction of foods and prevention of later development of food allergies. There are, however, certain criteria to follow when considering early introduction. I know this is difficult for a lot of people to understand because what they thought they knew about food allergies now is already changing. Let's have you start by quickly reviewing the difference between food allergies, sensitivities, and other GI issues that may look like an allergy or sensitivity, like IBS or celiac. Well, there are different types of reactions that can occur after eating a food. It's very easy for a person to think it must be a food allergy, especially if they have a little knowledge of what a food allergy really is. Food allergies, food sensitivities, and food intolerance all involve something not working the way it should in the body. So when the body perceives a food as a problem, a number of symptoms can occur. A food allergy is the reaction of the body's immune system to a specific food. Typically, the protein component of the food the body identifies as harmful. We call the food that is harmful an allergen. We often hear it referred to as an IgE-mediated food allergy because that's the part of the immune system that is involved. Food allergens cause reactions that involve one or more areas of the body. Some of the reactions include, but are not limited to, rashes, hives, itching, swelling of the lips, tongue, or throat, difficulty breathing, wheezing, abdominal pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. Even very small amounts of a food allergen are capable of triggering symptoms in a sensitive individual. Reactions can occur immediately or hours later. Food allergies can be life-threatening, and the best way to prevent a reaction is total avoidance of the trigger food. Food sensitivity can have many of the same symptoms as a food allergy. However, food sensitivity is a very complex, non-allergic, inflammatory reaction, usually a result of the food passing through a weakened membrane of the digestive tract. Kathy, you may have heard this weakened membrane referred to as leaky gut, but that's an extensive topic we'll have to cover in another podcast. Food sensitivities, due to their inflammatory process, play a role in irritable bowel syndrome, migraine, fibromyalgia, arthritis, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, autism spectrum disorders, eczema, other skin disorders, reflux, and many other gastrointestinal disorders. Some people will suffer for a long period of time, try to self-diagnose, and take over-the-counter aids without seeking proper medical advice. Skin and blood tests are part of the process of determining if the food reactions are a food allergy or a food sensitivity. They are more of a screening tool and don't diagnose the problem. A physical exam, a food symptom diary, an elimination diet, in addition to history of food reactions, are also important in making an accurate diagnosis. I've worked with many people who think they are eating a healthy diet, only to find out a food or foods they are eating on a regular basis don't work for their body and are causing their troublesome symptoms. One more thing is food intolerance. It's typically when the body is missing what it needs to properly break down ingested food. Lactose intolerance is a good example. A person with lactose intolerance does not have enough of the enzyme lactase to properly digest lactose, the milk sugar found in food. Food intolerances can be mild or severe. Sometimes they depend on the form of the food, the time of the day it's consumed, and whether it's consumed on an empty stomach. Other intolerances listeners may be familiar with are non-celiac gluten intolerance and fructose intolerance. We're hearing new information about food allergies and whether the pregnant mother should eat or avoid certain foods. 
or whether foods like peanuts or gluten should be introduced to the infant at a certain age. What do we need to know? Well, Kathy, this question comes up quite often, especially if the mom has already had a child with food allergies. Guidelines for what to eat while pregnant or breastfeeding have changed in the past few years. Also, there are new guidelines for introducing foods to infants. The old recommendations advised to wait until the child was older to introduce certain foods that are common allergens, but all of that has changed now. Research, which includes the well-known LEAP study, which is learning early about peanut allergy, has identified early introduction of allergens, primarily peanut, as a way to develop oral tolerance and reduce peanut allergy in at-risk infants. Research on early introduction of foods includes gluten as well. During pregnancy, consuming a nutritious diet is very important. It's not necessary to avoid highly allergenic foods, and a pregnant woman should not unnecessarily restrict her diet. Research has shown allergen avoidance does not make a difference whether or not the child develops allergies. More studies are needed on peanut allergy in pregnancy because some studies have shown peanut consumption in pregnancy increases the risk of the baby developing a peanut allergy, while other studies have shown just the opposite. Women should always consult with their doctor, especially if there's a family history of food allergies or that they have food allergies themselves. But for the most part, it's not necessary to avoid highly allergenic foods during pregnancy. Solid foods may be introduced to infants between the ages of four and six months now if they are at the stage of development where they can sit with support, have enough head and neck control, and are able to take foods without choking. If there is a family history of peanut allergy or other children in the family with a peanut allergy, it's best to discuss adding peanut to the child's diet with their allergist. If the child has eczema and has demonstrated possible reactions to the ingestion of food, typically egg, the allergist should be consulted before introducing peanut. The primary care physician or the pediatrician will provide the referral to the allergist if the child is considered high risk for the development of peanut allergy. I do want to emphasize, Kathy, that the child is considered high risk if they have eczema and or a demonstrated allergy to egg. The allergist may administer a skin test and determine whether or not to introduce peanut based on the test result. A positive test just means it's a positive test, but is not a diagnosis. If there is a positive test and a history of symptoms, the allergist will make the diagnosis, recommend how to proceed, and whether the introduction of peanut should be done in the medical office or home. Guidelines for feeding infants still include trying the least allergenic foods first, using single ingredient foods, and if there are no feeding issues, moving on to the allergenic foods next. All foods should be introduced in small amounts, slowly, and spaced at least three to five days apart. If introducing allergenic foods, it's best to do it early in the day when the child can be observed for several hours. We never want a child to consume a new or potentially allergenic food prior to bedtime when it's not as easy to monitor the child's tolerance. When introducing peanut, it's best to use nut butters, pastes, or powders added to an already tolerated food, especially since the recommendation is to offer three times a week some form of peanut to introduce the peanut to the child. The American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology has a great video on their website. It's called Peanuts in Your Baby, How to Introduce the Two. That's very helpful for parents to watch. There is similar speculation regarding gluten in the diet of infants for reducing the risk of celiac disease. The American Academy of Pediatrics has not yet made official recommendations regarding the reduction of celiac disease but it has been reported that the risk of celiac disease is significantly reduced in infants who are introduced to gluten during breastfeeding starting at four months of age. Which foods are the common allergens? Well, any food can be an allergen, but the most common food allergens are referred to as the big eight. They are milk, eggs, soy, wheat, fish, shellfish, peanut, and tree nuts. It is possible for other foods to be allergens, as I mentioned, and it is possible to develop a food allergy at any time in life. 
although food allergies are more prevalent in young children. Young children can lose their allergies to milk, egg, wheat, and soy, but often not peanut, tree nut, fish, and shellfish. Kathy, I've worked with young children who have been allergic to one or more foods, later are able to eat those foods without a problem, and then later develop an allergy to another food. One of my patients was allergic to egg and milk as an infant, and by age five was able to eat both egg and milk without a problem, but then later as a teenager developed an allergy to tree nuts. You're listening to Nutrition Edge on ReachMD. I'm dietitian Kathy King, and I'm speaking with dietitian and food allergy counselor Deborah Indorado, and we're exploring food allergies. Deb, you work with the Kids with Food Allergies.org, a division of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. How intertwined are food allergies and asthma? I mentioned earlier that wheezing is one of the symptoms of a food allergy reaction. Asthma symptoms can occur when there's inflammation of the lower airways, and exposure to asthma triggers can include food allergens and can cause an asthma attack. Many of the children I've worked with had both allergies and asthma, but for some of them, an asthma attack was triggered by food, although not many people with asthma have food allergies. There are many other asthma triggers. I know that diets are individualized, but are there general nutrition guidelines for living in a family with a child or an adult with food allergies? Well, Kathy, first of all, education is the key. It's very important to know everything possible about the foods a person is allergic to. And that can include what foods they are found in, what other names the allergens are identified by, how to read labels for allergens, and how cross-contact can occur. An example of what to look for when reading a label would be seeing the word whey. Whey is a milk protein that needs to be avoided in milk allergic individuals. There are a number of other terms for milk ingredients, and the Kids with Food Allergies website has extensive lists of allergy terminology and guides for how to read a label. Do dietitians have training in food allergies, or where can you find a knowledgeable practitioner? Well, while most dietitians can help plan a nutritious diet, not all dietitians are trained in food allergy. The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology offer training programs in food allergy. Both of them have information on their websites for how to find a dietitian or a practitioner who can help. Can you summarize three or four points you want us to remember about food allergies? Definitely. Education about food allergies is important, and food allergic individuals and their families should learn as much as possible about food allergens and how to recognize and treat reactions. Don't take what appears to be a mild reaction lightly. Follow the treatment plan outlined by the allergist and always carry prescribed treatment medication and have emergency numbers handy. Be prepared for food situations, both at home and away from home. It's often best to pack allergen-free meals and snacks and to be on the safe side when away from home. And food allergic individuals and those with a family history of allergy should seek advice from a qualified health professional who have been properly trained in food allergy and sensitivity. Don't try to self-diagnose. Deb, thank you for bringing us your nutrition insight on food allergies. Our guest has been dietitian and food allergy consultant Deborah Indorado. We've been discussing exploring food allergies. I'm Kathy King, and you've been listening to Nutrition Edge on ReachMD. Be sure to visit our website at reachmd.com featuring podcasts of this and other series. And thank you for listening.